So yeah, good morning. Um, for those of you who have joined us already, my name is Glenn Poole. I'm uh, the CEO of the Australian Men's Health Forum. This is uh, Men's Health Connected, uh, a month-long summit on men's health. And today's uh, topic is sport and men's health. Um, well, there's a few more people in the room. I'll just give you a little uh, guide around uh, the features of Zoom and how we'll be using those uh, today. Um, but for now, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll be starting around about 10 o'clock and the nature of this thing is uh, people will suddenly all log on at one minute past 10. So uh, hang on in there, get yourself a drink if you want one. The first session runs from 10 till 11.30 and we have uh, uh, three fantastic speakers in the opening session. So uh, you're in for a treat. And when we've got a few more people in the room, I'll pop back and give you a guide around some of the features of Zoom. Health Forum. Uh, good morning, Jeff. So we're just going to ask you to, there you are, unmuted. Hi. Great. Good to see you, Jeff. It's good to get her and, and hello. Uh, and also good to hear that your sound is working and your, your, your vision is on. Are you sharing any slides this morning, Jeff? Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to make you a co-host, which will enable you to share slides. And are, are, are you familiar with slide sharing in, in Zoom? Yes. Great. It uh, seems like a silly question to ask people these days. A couple of months ago, it didn't. A couple of months ago, the question was, have you heard of Zoom? True. <laughs> Make co-host. Okay. And you're, off, you're on first, Jeff, but we'll have a few minutes of just introduction and uh, shape of the day and that kind of stuff. So unlikely to get you before uh, five past ten at the earliest. Okay. I'll re mute then. Thank you. And I see Tim Branston's joined us from WA. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, mate. Can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear. Thank you. That's excellent. Thanks, thank, thanks for being the early bird in the room. <laughs> That's it, mate. I've got my coffee here. It's, uh, it's very early over here. <laughs> excellent. So I can hear you. I can see you. And are you sharing slides, Tim? Uh, yeah, I will do if that's all right. Totally okay. Uh, I'm just going to make you a co-host so you're able to share your screen and um, I'm just going to ask the same question uh, I've asked of Jeff and Phil. Tim, you familiar with sharing slides on Zoom? You're, you're muted, I can't hear you, sorry. You're going to have to unmute. Yeah, sorry, you paused on me there. Um, yes, all good. I have shared. All oh, good. Excellent. Okay. Okay, so we'll start in about five minutes. Um, just going to give people who are starting to arrive and may not have uh, been to one of our Zoom sessions before 
um, a little guide around the features of Zoom. So good morning, I'm Glenn, I'm from the Australian Men's Health Forum, and this is Men's Health Connected, and you're here today for our uh, event on sport and men's health with uh, the first session of the day starting in about five minutes. Um, now we find from these events that um, uh, there are some limitations of doing events online. You can't um, meet and chat to people over the, over the coffee table or, or, get, or get the advantage of free Danish pastries. However, there are some things we can do on Zoom which we can't do in the real world. Um, and one is the chat feature. So most of the things that you'll need to really enjoy your Zoom experience can be found in the bottom black bar. So if you hover your cursor over the bottom black bar, the first um, button you want to find is, is chat. And so that's obviously a speech bubble. If you click on that uh, once or twice, uh, you'll find a chat box. Um, and in there, and I'm gonna do this now, you can message to everyone. You'll find in here, we post information about the speakers, links to uh, their websites or sometimes to the research. Often speakers will reference something and we might find a link and post it there. Um, but it's not all about us pushing information towards you. You're very welcome to use the chat box to chat, to ask questions, to introduce yourself, to share information, um, however you like. And you can save the chat at the very end um, for the period you've been in the room by clicking on the three dots uh, on the right hand side of the chat box there. Um, so do please use that feature. Uh, one of the great things with Zoom is when you're at a, at, a, at a real life event, you can whisper to the person next to you, but you can't shout out across the entire room. Here, we don't encourage you to shout out across the entire Zoom, but you can whisper across the entire Zoom by posting to, to everyone. So really encourage you to do that. Um, the next feature I'm going to highlight is again, back on the, uh, back to the bar at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, next to the chat box, uh, you'll find a, uh, an icon called Participants. If you click on that a couple of times, that'll give you the names of the people uh, in the room. Um, and that's useful for yourself. You can um, mute and unmute your microphone, turn your camera on and off there, as well as on the bottom bar. We can mute you if you're making noises in the background. But also importantly, there's some icons here um, um, there's a tick, there's a cross, there's a go fast, a go slow. The one that gets used the most is, um, is the hands up icon. A couple of people want to click a hands up icon. I'm not going to come to you, but if you want to click a hands up icon, let's see if that's working. Yep, I've seen a couple of hands go up there. So that's a feature that we can use. Thank you, Sudamit. Um, that's, that's a feature we can use when it comes to asking questions rather than people trying to shout out. We can come and say, put your hand up if you've got a question. And you can also post questions in the, uh, in, the, in, in the chat box. Just keeps the room nice and clean and uh, helps us run the, the, the chat smoothly. Um, there's also some icons, icons on the bottom bar because the other thing is hard to do is to, is to clap. I mean, you can clap, but usually you're muted. So it's like this. So it just looks like you're chasing flies or something. Um, so if you want to clap in a, in a Zoom appropriate way, um, you again on the bottom bar uh, to the right hand side, there's a little smiley face and it's called reactions. Two reactions are in there, the clap, go and try that now if you want, and the thumbs up. It's really great for the speakers because uh, one of the things about speaking on Zoom is that you can't, one well, of the great things is you don't have to travel. You don't have to even, you know, go outside of your own house at the moment. You can attend a conference to speak in 15 minutes and then get on with the rest of your day. One of the downsides is you can't actually smell the audience. Um, and when you're speaking, that can be a bit disconcerting because you're not getting any kind of feedback. You can't feel the energy of the room. So if there's something that you really value or some a point you like, you really like, then do use, do, do feel free to use those, uh, use those features. Give the, give the speakers a bit of a, a bit of encouragement. I see we're coming to 10 o'clock. We've got about 21 participants in the room. Um, so, um, morning, Neil Hall. Thanks for joining us. Tim Hewson from Mongrels Men. Good to see you, Bron. Uh, thank you for being here. One last, uh, one last feature then, um, to make it easier for people to see who you are, then uh, a couple of things you can do to rename yourself. One of the easiest places to do this is again, back in the participants box, get used to using this. So bottom black bar, look for the chat feature, look for the participants box, click on that and you'll find usually your names at the top, hover over your name and you'll see a button called more, click on that and you get two options usually, rename and add profile pic. 
So um, for future reference, you can add a picture of yourself here. That means when you turn your camera off, people can still see who it is or they can see the logo of your organization. But the renaming feature is quick and simple and really easy to do now. You, you might come up as, you know, uh, Mr. J1237. It's nice to call yourself Jeff Smith or John Brown so people know who you are. You can even add things like the name of an organization or where you are in the country. Just makes it a bit more uh, warm and friendly when we've actually got names rather than numbers, but also gives people a sense of who you are when you, when you join in, when you make a comment, when you speak. So please do rename yourself if you want to. Um, and so we can see your full name or the name of your organization or your project. Um, so we've gone past um, 10 o'clock. It's, uh, we've had about a, a hundred plus people register for this event. Um, we find usually around about uh, a half to 60% of the people who register attend. I'm guessing that um, we didn't think through that it's a Tuesday morning after a, a long weekend in most of the country, which might make it a tough time, but I can see the numbers are still creeping up towards 30. And um, we are recording every session, so we will make sure that the talks and these sessions are also available and sh shared further and wider with uh, a, a great audience, I'm sure. So that's me. We've gone past 10 o'clock. Um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague uh, and president of AMHF, Greg Milan, to chair this first session in a moment. But let me just do a few, few announcements. So. Uh, thanks all for being here. And first, I uh, want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where we all meet around Australia and, and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us here today. Uh, I'm joining you from the traditional lands of the Greng Greng, the Grang, the Bunda and the Belai people up on the central coast of Queensland. Uh, which uh, is between Bundaberg and Gladstone. So um, we've got a fantastic day lined up today. I've long wanted to do the Australian Men's Health Forum is a peak body for men's health organisations uh, around Australia. We place a strong focus on the social factors that shape our health. So we don't just look at health from a medical perspective. We look at all aspects of health, fatherhood, relationship, impacts of housing and finance and those types of things. Um, and broadly speaking, the thing that unites uh, us and our members and our supporters is that they're all interested in some way in improving the lives and the health of, of men and boys. And we're really interested in, for example, how do we make services more accessible to men, more male friendly? And um, one resource that's available to us that's often mentioned when we talk about making health programs more engaging for men is the resource of sport and men's love of sport. So we've long wanted to get together different people uh, to talk about how can we use sport as a, as a, as a resource to engage men in, in health. And it was by sport, yes, we mean, you know, professional sport, but also community sport, but also, you know, recreational activity and physical exercise as well. They all sort of uh, overlap. And we don't just mean getting men doing sport to stay fit. We're talking about how sports clubs and sports brands can be venues to engage men in programs or how um, um, the communities around sports clubs can be places to, to re reach men in the broader community as they may be more likely to be found at a local sports club than they are at a local health center. So there's a real diversity of conversation today. Um, in the second session this morning, we're specifically looking at how program, different programs have been used in, in the field of men's mental health and male suicide prevention. Um, this afternoon, we've got a conversation around um, how could we use sports brands more to engage men in health programs. Um, we've managed to get a lunchtime talk from, um, from Paul Peacock from Bouncing Back, a cricket-based program in WA, who's going to talk about his program, but also... Um, have a conversation around how sports-based programs are responding in the context of COVID-19. Um, and then just a general open forum at the end to cover off any kind of ideas and thoughts and questions that we, we haven't covered. But we thought we'd start by laying down the basics um, and sort of asking, well, are, is sport good for men's health? It's kind of, it's not rocket science, is it? And that's exactly what we've called this, um, this, this first session. Um, and I'm going to hand over to my, um, my, my colleague and president of AMHF, um, Greg Milan, to guide you 
through this first session. Thanks, Greg. Great. Thanks, Glenn. Welcome, everybody, to this session. Our first speaker today is Professor uh, Jeff Coombs, who's the Director of the Centre for Research on Exercise, Physical Activity and Health School of Human Movement and Nutrition Sciences. He's a prof uh, he studies at the University of Queensland and he's the National Director of Exercise is Medicine, a global initiative led by the American College of Sports Medicine and managed in Australia by the Exercise and Sports Science of, of Australia. Welcome along, Jeff, and I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thanks, Greg and Glenn, for the invite. It's a fantastic initiative you, you guys have got, and I'm certainly happy to be involved with it and share my knowledge. So uh, hopefully you can see now on the screen the slides, and I guess just like the topic, it's not rocket science, my topic, why exercise is medicine, is extremely easy to cover. So I'm not going to spend too long, I've just got 10 slides, and then I'm really keen to be involved in the question and answer towards the end if any of the participants would like to explore some of what I'm going to present in a little bit more detail. So as an exercise physiologist, it, ex it always surprises me just how the impact of exercise is on our body, how it has such a, a wide and varied and healthful impact on all these different you're certainly probably all aware of its cardiovascular benefits, it improves the heart and its function, function it improves the blood vessels in its function. In terms of the metabolic side, that's really come into the fore in the last 20 years, now that we know just how powerful exercise is for improving conditions such as diabetes. In terms of the muscular side of things, improving strength, especially as we get older, is really important to offset frailty and increase our activities of daily living and quality of life for as long as possible. Exercise improves the strength of our bones, so that it increases our risk of getting weak bones and fractures as we get older. Hormonally, it improves the way that a lot of our systems function, uh, especially around controlling how well the body works in general. So we have a much better uh, uh, steady state metabolism and control of our physiology through exercise improving the hormonal system. And the last one there, in terms of its work on the brain and central nervous system, that's probably again in recent years, seen a huge amount of evidence showing the benefits of exercise to improve mental health and neurological functioning. So the amount of evidence out there on the benefits of exercise and sport on health and the, the way that it works is just enormous and like I said it probably doesn't need much more than than just saying what a powerful uh, thing to do it is. So what is are people exercising? So unfortunately they're not in terms of Australian data. 60% of Australia are actually uh, doing less than what's recommended which is to, and I'll talk a bit more later about the, the actual physical activity guidelines but in terms of just Aerobic exercise, the recommended 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity, 60% of Australians are doing less than that. So only about 40% are actually meeting those guidelines. So what does this result in? It results in it increasing the risk of getting diseases such as cancer, diabetes and heart disease considerably. The numbers are there. Go into those in a little bit more detail in a second. And in the big picture, when you start comparing it to other uh, lifestyle-related factors such as smoking, it comes in as the second greatest contributor to cancer in Australia. So being inactive and unfit has a huge, is a huge problem for our health. So a little bit more of the specifics of if you start exercising, if you go from being sedentary, what does it actually do to your overall risk of disease or improving your condition if you've got one. So these are just four of the main conditions that exercise can benefit on this slide. And there's a few more on the next with some numbers around how uh, impactful exercise is on these conditions. So in women, a 50% reduction in breast cancer. 
high blood pressure decreased by 50%. That leads to a decrease in stroke by about 27%. The risk of diabetes reduces by about half when you exercise. Colon cancer, huge impact on your gastrointestinal risk of cancer, so 60%. Depression, as I mentioned before, the mental health benefits, uh, we're seeing that it's as effective as current medications on treating depression. The big one that gets the most uh, um, coverage is its risk on heart, decreased reduction in heart disease, which is the biggest killer, and 40% reduction in the risk of heart disease when you exercise. And in terms of keeping cognition as you get older, if you're fit, you've got one third the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease as you get older. So, extremely impressive numbers and obviously this data has been collected over many studies different countries many years so the evidence is very very strong i mentioned before how it lines up against smoking for cancer but this is now how being low fit lines up against some of the other um, risk factors for dying so the higher the bar means the more chance is that you're going to die the green is for men and the blue is for women. And pretty clearly, the first observation is that by being low fit, you're more at risk of dying, no matter whether you're a man or a woman, uh, compared to being obese, compared to being a smoker, even if you've got high blood pressure, high cholesterol and diabetes. In fact, I've seen this graph rearranged where diabetes is stacked on top of high cholesterol and stacked on top of obesity, and even with those three things, your risk of dying from anything is still greater if you are low fit. So it really should be a public health focus to move people from being low fit, get them exercising and uh, increase their um, health and risk of living longer, improve their um, longevity. Currently, our health system very much focuses on medications, on pills. So I think it's important to know just how many medications our elderly are taking. And currently, people over the age of 65, from 65 to 69, take 14 different prescription drugs a year, different types. And if you're over the eight, or between 80 and 84, that goes up to 18 different types of drugs per year. So that's the average of how many drugs people are taking. The problem with this is that there's a lot of side effects by taking the drugs and it also leads to um, increased number of hospitalizations. But certainly our first approach currently our health system is to look at whether there's a drug to treat the condition. What we should be doing is trying to promote more and get people more physically active. And of course, this is the, the all important question. We know it's great. How do you do it? And uh, the next two speakers will talk about programs that try to do this. Uh, it's really important to know what the current physical activity guidelines are. And we split them up into, oops, we split them up into both aerobic exercise and muscle strengthening or resistance exercise. And the recommendations are to do 150 at least, or anywhere up to 300 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise. So exercise, at a level that gets you huffing and puffing, where you can um, still carry on, still carry on a conversation. Just is a good way of looking at uh, the intensity side of things. Or if you want to go a little bit higher, where you can no longer carry on a conversation easily, then taking it into the vigorous intensity range. You would then, if you do vigorous intensity, you only need to do half as much if, than compared to moderate intensity. And that's something our group is very interested in from a research perspective, the increased benefits of doing that higher intensity exercise um, for those people that enjoy it and will do it. And then the one that tends to get forgotten about a lot is muscle strengthening exercise. Before you heard that uh, only um, around 40% of people are meeting the aerobic physical activity guidelines. Well, it's much less when you actually look at the muscle strengthening resistance training guidelines. So, these are the guidelines doing combining both each week. Um, certainly you should do um, at least uh, do a little and gradually build up um, if you're starting from a low base. 
And in terms of frequency, try and do it on most, if not all days of the week. So just finishing up talking about the initiative that I'm involved with, which is the Exercise as Medicine Initiative. Uh, our vision is to make physical activity a standard component of chronic disease prevention and management by focusing at this point, at the patient doctor coalface, where we encourage doctors, especially GPs, to talk to their patients more about the benefits of exercising and to encourage them to be more physically active and to improve their fitness. So I'll finish just with that statement, exercise is the best, cheapest, and most accessible medicine available. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jeff. And you've come in a bit um, earlier uh, on your time allocation. Thanks very much. That's a really good overview. Um, I have a couple of questions. We'll leave questions till the, till the end um, of this session and after our speakers. Um, the next person I'd like to introduce is um, Professor Phil Morgan, who um, is the Deputy Director at the University of Newcastle Priority Research Centre for Physical Activity and Nutrition. And I've met um, Philip on quite a few occasions now as we both live in Newcastle and he's doing some great work. He's the founder of a number of um, amazing interventions that engage fathers to improve family health, including healthy dads, healthy kids, healthy youngsters, healthy dads, and now daughters and dads active and empowered. So I'll hand you over to Phil. Hey, thank Thanks. you very much. Let me just check. Uh... You guys seen that screen there? Yep, all good. You can see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Greg, for that introduction. And to Glenn, can everyone hear me okay here? Coming from the study, uh, it's great to have my first invited yep. presentation wearing my Ugg boots, which is fantastic. <laughs> so I appreciate the opportunity. Um, today, I'll be talking about a few of our programs and some of you may be familiar with those. And while there are a number of outcomes we're looking to achieve in, the, in our programs, one of the really key recruitment hooks is that of engaging with children through the physical domain, in particular an opportunity to help develop their sports skills. And so in this program, we're targeting fathers. In particular, it's, uh, it's really important to, um, to highlight that, um, that these are also uh, let me just check here, sorry. That when we're talking about fathers, it's not just the biological father. So in our program, we have grandfathers, uncles, stepfathers, um, friends of the family, any father figure in their children's lives. And so some of the programs that I'll just be drawing from today include Healthy Dads, Healthy Kids. These have been published as well. So if anyone's uh, looking to find out more about these programs, I'm happy to share that information. There's a program with dads with sons and daughters of primary school age. We've also had adaptations of that in the UK, uh, also recently published as well, our adaptation, cultural adaptation for uh, Hispanic families in the USA. We've published a cultural adaptation paper and also uh, a feasibility paper led by Teresa O'Connor. And we also have uh, a grant in going through the system to work with Healthy Dads, Healthy Kids uh, into the Scottish Prison Service with incarcerated fathers. So that's pretty exciting. We have our Healthy Youngsters, Healthy Dads, which is for fathers um, with preschool age children, sons and daughters. Our Daughters and Dads program, where we're trying to address some of those issues our girls face. Um, and that's also being uh, rolled out and adapted in the UK in partnership with Women in Sport. And also to acknowledge that uh, in our research team, we've done lots of work in family-based programs and I'll talk a little bit about the rationale for why we're targeting fathers, but before the Daughters and Dads program, we had a Mothers and Daughters program as well. So it's really interesting to explore the differential impact of these programs. Um, at the moment in New South Wales, we were uh, lucky enough and thrilled to secure a, a large grant from the Office of Sport to roll out the Daughters and Dads program across New South Wales, improving family relationships, um, sport and activity as an engagement key, but also as a key outcome. Um, and what's been really fascinating about this project is the interest from the sports sector. So we probably have eight or nine 
uh, different sports who uh, are really keen to do a sports specific variant. And we've just completed a pilot of our Daughters and Dads cricket program in partnership with Cricket New South Wales and Cricket Australia. So watch this space for some exciting developments in that domain. Uh, Jeff had outlined some of the issues we have with physical activity with adults. In the more recent report card for children, um, in a sort of a simple way to understand from an A to E scale, for Australian children, which may be a bit of a surprise for some, uh, in terms of a grade for overall physical activity levels, you're looking at a, a D minus. Organised sports participation, uh, a B minus, which may seem not too bad, but dropout in the teenage years is a major issue. Screen time, you know, anything up to three quarters of children exceed screen time recommendations. Not many are walking or riding to school. Fitness levels are low. And a particular concern is the children's ability to be able to, to throw and skip and jump and hop and bounce uh, and catch and kick is really quite poor. And so there's been questioned whether um, in these reports, do our kids have all the tools? And those tools include the skills to perform, um, and the confidence and competence in those domains as well. Uh, also, more recently, the decline in muscular fitness. So, some real key issues we're looking at there. So, for fundamental movement skills, we've published systematic reviews. So, we've looked at all the evidence to see, well, what if you're a skilled child, what is associated in terms of health benefits? So, these can take around 18 months to actually to work on. So, uh, Professor Lubin's led that review and basically found that children who are proficient in fundamental movement skills become fitter, more active and more confident adolescents. Now, many may think that, well, it's the school's domain to improve those particular areas and physical education should be that arena. But unfortunately, there are many issues with the delivery of those programs. Uh, it's a difficult, you know, when you've got 30 children out there, teachers who may not be as confident in that domain, generalist teachers. And so there is a real opportunity for parents to be able to help their children develop those the same as they would in literacy reading to your children, having conversations and really helps their development in that area. So similarly, there may be a role there. And then our other systematic review that I'd led looked at, well, if we did these interventions in improving their skills, would they have an impact? And the answer was yes. But from that review, we found that it had to be um, a classroom teacher who was highly trained or a specialist PE teacher. And from that review, we also found some of the key characteristics of those interventions that we've been able to apply in our programs with parents. So um, developmentally appropriate activities, autonomy, having variety, student-centered approaches. So learning from the evidence, we can then filter that information through our particular programs. And so the question of why dads, I have just outlined some recent papers that we've published in that area, if anyone's interested in sharing also a recent chapter but you know, we have changed society and we know that whatever your family structure, that each of your behaviors and attitudes impacts on each other. There are concerns with men's physical activity and diet, but also that this modeling and parenting practices do influence their children's behavior. And when there's difference in parenting, uh, how you parent in terms of the feeding and activity domains, inconsistent parent can have an issue. And so a key is co-parenting. So how do we have uh, both parents on the same page. And there's been plenty of research that has demonstrated the impact of positive father involvement. And that's something we um, present to the fathers in our programs. But you look at the list of those particular outcomes for children and can see that um, based on thousands of international studies, when we control for mother's involvement, SES, family structure, number of children, that the impact of a positive male influence has on children is really quite profound. Um, but whether uh, this is a unique impact and independent, which has been questioned, one thing um, that I talk about in the recent chapter is the importance of this activation relationship. And this is where many fathers primarily bond with their children through physical play um, that is characterized by risk taking, competitiveness and vigorous and competition and fun. Uh, and this is played out where we are more likely to see fathers initiate, enjoy and sustain aspects of co-activity that's playing with their children, which has really holistic benefits for their children. And so we actually look to see, well, how many fathers have been involved in any physical activity, parenting, uh, nutrition, parenting, obesity prevention or treatment programs in the previous 10 years um, that they're actively involved because we weren't really sure. 
Um, and so again, this takes quite a, a long time to conduct. We looked at 213 randomized control trials, 803 full text articles, and we found that out of the 13 and a half thousand participants across the world in our trials, only 6% were fathers, so 94% mothers. So again, everything we know about the impact of parenting and parenting programs um, has been from the mother's perspective. So from a scientific perspective, it would be really interesting to explore um, a potential unique role of fathers. And what was also really quite concerning was in those 213 papers that looked at that particular area, um, only 2% actually had in their limitation section that a lack of fathers was an issue. Um, even more so that out of, out of all of those studies that were conducted, only 1% directly attempted to engage a father or father figure. Two, two groups that was, one was our group, and we actually had the only program that targeted fathers only, and another group that out of 13 sessions in their program, they invited their, the fathers along to bake muffins with their children. So other than the, the muffin baking session in Holland, there was no other uh, program that attempted to engage fathers. And even in all those systematic reviews that we uncovered, the word father was only mentioned five times in 10 years of research. So in our programs and collectively, what is really important, it's not just doing the practical activities. Our programs have education sessions and initially, whether it's the three to five year olds, the daughters, the sons, we have an initial session where they spend time together working through a whole range of issues and importantly, having an opportunity for meaningful conversation, having an opportunity to discuss their various tasks of the week, spending time together. Um, and then they split up and the fathers get an opportunity to have dad's only time, but also to learn, it's an education session. Where do you learn the latest evidence-based tips for parenting, to get your kids off screens, to promote physical activity, to understand the importance of role modeling and to share their experiences and have a voice. Um, and similarly, the children, they're learning different concepts and we really target things such as valued outcomes and reciprocal reinforcement. So they're helping each other. And for example, you know, getting your kids off screens, talking about the potential deleterious consequences of that for their metabolic health is not a great hook necessarily um, to think that um, for many of the families, but talking about those screens, robbing families of an opportunity for interaction and time spent together and conversations and showing how that meaningful conversation, the minutes we can connect with a child's self-esteem. So we work out ways to target key motivators within those particular families. And then our practical sessions, and this is where we use sport and the physical activity domain as a hook. So um, in all of our programs, they focus on a similar structure. And as was alluded to, we spoke about the benefits of both aerobic and muscular fitness providing an opportunity to not only just do the, do the activities, but learning correct technique, learning about the importance of correct technique to improve muscular strength, but also to prevent injuries, um, sports skills, having that opportunity for a one-on-one -on -one coach, um, given the associated benefits of doing that, but how to teach your children sports skills, uh, rough and tumble play, there's a whole science behind rough and tumble play as well um, that's uh, detailed in our papers. And so the results of our programs have been impactful across the board, improvements in activity in some of our dietary behaviours, improved social emotional being in parenting, maybe most importantly, improvements in the quality of the father-child relationship. And what's really interesting is that we conducted the systematic review where we look at the effect sizes of interventions. What, if we were to compare different programs, what has been the impact and the impact of our programs where we target dads are some of the greatest uh, effect sizes for sports skills or fundamental movement skills there is in the literature. And it kind of makes sense when you're comparing a father who's there with their child, has the right teaching strategies and has the time to invest versus in a classroom setting where there's lots of kids and it's much harder to give that individualized attention and error detection and correction. And so uh, what an another interesting aspect of some of the work that we've done uh, is forms of mediation. Now, so this basically means of, of the different strategies we use to target in, uh, physical activity. And this was for our daughters and dads program. Of all the things we did, we tried to make them more skillful, tried to give the father various parenting strategies, tried to improve the girls' fundamental movement skills. 
what was the thing that led to the improvements in activity? So we conduct this more sophisticated statistical analysis. And what we found um, was that co-activity was the key ingredient for daughters being active. And some people think, well, okay, that kind of makes sense and is not too groundbreaking. If I'm more active together with my daughter, um, then it's more likely she'll be active. But what was probably more interesting when we looked at social and emotional being as an outcome. So what was the key mediator? What was the thing that explained that variation and that variable? And what was also quite interesting is we looked at, we measured the daughter's social and emotional being from both the father's and mother's perspective. And we also found that co-activity was the key mediator. And then we checked the father-daughter relationship, so the quality relationship from both the father and daughter's perspective. And again, co-physical activity came through as a significant media. So this was really quite um, profound and really demonstrated that being active together with your daughter in this particular study was a thing that explained not only the improvements in how active she was, but also how good she felt about herself, her self-esteem, and also the quality of the relationship from both her, their perspective. And so as a key take home message, there's importance of exercise, but if you can have strategies to motivate your family to be able to do activities together, um, then this could be really key for some really important variables that may be more motivating in and of themselves to achieve. But as a Dr. Seuss, many say, it's fun to have fun, but you have to know how. So some families do struggle to motivate their children and or themselves to be active together, and particularly as they get older. So our programs really focus on enhanced co-PA, we talk at activities where you do it together. So a basic form of co-PA may be, hey, do you wanna come outside and kick a ball with me? Uh, yeah, maybe some do, and that's okay. But what are some other ways where we can motivate families to make activities more fun and I think a way to characterize enhanced co-PA is moving, laughing, talking, and learning. So if you're, if you're outside and doing those particular activities and there's some of the elements, then you could probably say that they're enhanced. And the acronym we use is Hammered Up Dads. And this on the surface looks quite simple, but it does embed many of our um, principles from our um, systematic reviews of adding a hook, making it engaging, giving them some choice and ensuring the activities are developmentally appropriate. So plenty of activities where they're not too easy and not too hard. Um, and for those who are wondering, enhanced co-PA, this is not enhanced co-PA, although it does look pretty enjoyable. You are outside with your child. So uh, in finishing, I would like to just acknowledge all my research team and assistants that have been involved in this project and also many of our funding partners. Thank you very much. I think you might be on mute there, Greg. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, I'd like to introduce our third speaker today, Timothy, Timothy Branston. He's the program manager for um, Man versus Fat Soccer, or should I say football, and has a passion for getting traditionally non-active groups involved in sports and recreation. Prior to his involvement in Man versus Fat Soccer, he managed a wide range of recreational short courses for the local um, Perth community and worked for the West Australian State Government at various recreation camps. Take it away, Tim. Thank you very much, Greg. And um, I'll just double check as well. Can everyone see my slides here? Are they, are they showing? Yep, they're good. Yep, yep perfect. Um, so thanks, Greg. And thanks also to Jeff and Philip. That was um, some really interesting stuff. So. Um, as you said, I'm, I'm the program manager of a program called Man Beef Fat Soccer, um, which is what I'm here to talk about today. So um, I was really excited when I uh, got asked or got the opportunity to chat at this particular event, um, because I think the success of our program is not just an example of, um, you know, the success of our specific program. It really is an example of why sport-based programs in general um, are so successful for men. So um, it, yeah, it really is perfect what we're actually chatting about today. So 
what I might um, quickly do is actually spend a couple of minutes explaining the program and how it all works so we can have a bit of context because uh, people are always intrigued by the name Man Be Fat Soccer when they hear that. Um, so it did initially start, it's funny you say about Man Be Fat Football there, Greg, because it, it actually did um, start as a program called Man Be Fat Football over in the UK. Um, we, at the University of Western Australia, we have a, a research team um, called the Psychology of Active Healthy Living Group. They heard about the program over in the UK, reached out to them, and uh, we ended up actually bringing the program over to Australia as a University of Western Australia program. And uh, after much back and forth, we ended up having to go with the name Man Be Fat Soccer over here. But um, what the program actually is, basically, it's, uh, it's a men's weight loss program. Um, it uses soccer as a tool to change, uh, change behavior and drive health improvement. So um, we do essentially say it's, it's a weight loss program. It's, it's not necessarily a soccer program. Um, we target overweight and obese adult males with a BMI of over 27 and a half. So that's actually the entry limit to um, join the program is a BMI of over 27 and a half. Um, and the crux of the program, I suppose, is basically each week, the guys visit a facility to play a game of soccer with their teammates. Um, but the result of the match is actually determined not only by the result on the field, but also by the result off the field, which is determined by uh, they step on the scales and actually weigh in each week. Um, so how does it actually work? Basically, they, they register online for a league in their local area. So we've got leagues all around Australia. Uh, well in a couple of states in Australia at the moment, which I'll touch on a bit later, but um, join a league and then they'll actually get allocated to a team um, generally based on a BMI. So we try and spread BMIs evenly across all teams. Um, they'll attend an information session at the start of a season. So we'll establish some baseline metrics such as our weight, height, um, maybe some waist measurements, those sort of things. And then from there, they'll basically attend a weekly soccer fixture for the following 14 weeks. Um, most importantly, however, along that 14 week journey is that we will uh, support them with a number of different resources. Um, so they'll have a, a behavioral change handbook. Um, so they'll actually have to fill out their diet and exercise throughout the week. Um, there's a dedicated weight loss coach. So every league site has a professional staff member that generally has a background in sport and nutrition or exercise, that sort of field. And they will actually have a look at that handbook each week, look at the food, look at the exercise that's been done. And they'll give each player um, some individual feedback really tailored to them before their way in each week. Um, we've also got, there's an online forum that the guys can chat in throughout the week. And um, we've also got some uh, online messaging groups so that they'll have team WhatsApp groups, which are a really important part of the program. So, you know, I'll touch on that a little bit later when I talk about uh, why it works. Um, the hook is the losers win scoring system, as we call it. So essentially the way that it works is uh, before each game, a player will weigh in. If the player loses weight from the previous week, they score half a goal of bonus for their team before they even step out onto the pitch to play a game. So um, any weight loss scores that half a goal. So basically we're trying to encourage slow, sustainable weight loss. So we would rather a player lose a little bit of weight every week for the 14 weeks than you know, come out of the gates and lose five kilos in a week and then drop off. So um, the way we manage that is exactly. So we don't actually reward for the amount of weight loss. It's just half a goal if you lose weight. Um, and then following on from that, it's the scoring system is based on the number of players who lose weight, not the total weight loss figure. So again, um, if say one team has six blokes that all lost a really small amount of weight, that team is still going to be more successful than another one that maybe has one guy who lost an absolute ton of weight and nobody else did. Um, a couple of other little bonuses we've got built in is uh, we've got what's called a hat trick bonus, which is... Um, players will earn an extra goal on the third consecutive week that they've lost weight. And also we hand out some bonuses for 5% um, and 10% of total body weight loss. So basically uh, over time, the guys will begin to realize very quickly that the scoring system is skewed pretty heavily to the off field and the weight loss side of things um, over actually going out there and playing a game of soccer. So, um, I probably won't go into all the details of that too much more, but you can, you can feel free to ask any questions at the end about that. Um, but what we're here to chat about today is basically um, 
the results of the program and why it's actually been so successful. So one of the really good things about this program being a UWA initiative is um, while I personally am in charge of managing mainly just the operations of the program, we do have the research team involved, which I referenced before. So um, we've got the psychology of active healthy living group involved. And we also actually had a student at UWA who did a PhD into the program. So um, we've got lots of really, really good data on the program. Um, and that was done not only through the weigh-ins each week, but also through some pretty extensive surveying. So um, during the first season of any new league site, there'll be a pre-season survey, a number of surveys throughout the season, and then another survey at the conclusion of the 14 weeks. So um, some of the results we've seen from that basically over 3,600 kilograms we've lost in Australia so far. And uh, that's since you know, about September, 2018. So um, we haven't even had two full years just yet. And we're, uh, we're nearing 4,000 kilograms lost, which is, um, yeah, I think that's a really awesome effort. Um, I'm seeing the average BMI drop in, a, in the first season is from 34 down to 32. And we generally see an average weight loss of approximately 5% of a player's body weight over their first season, which again, is a really awesome achievement. Um, our waist circumference down from seven centimetre, down seven centimetres, sorry, and hip circumference down five centimetres. Um, fatty food, we saw was down 16%. Sugary food down 15%. Fruit and veggies up 20%, uh, 28%, sorry. And physical activity almost doubled. So... Most of those things, again, um, they kind of tie in with those handbook things and the coach and they're, they're just getting a bunch of uh, advice that they perhaps hadn't received from anywhere else before. Um, what I'm personally uh, most interested in with the results of this program, however, is um, the things we've seen and the outcomes in mental health. So um, the program, while these results aren't necessarily surprising, obviously, but um, when it started in the UK, and you can tell by the name, it was primarily designed as a weight loss program, which obviously targets physical health. But um, along the way, uh, and as the research began to unfold, we noticed that the, the benefits to the mental health and um, even just the anecdotal feedback we get from players was the thing that really began to stand out in this program. So. Um, you can see the table on the right here. Some of the results we've seen there is uh, with depression. And again, this was just over one 14 week season, which obviously evolved further from there, but um, that was down 19%. Anxiety was down 8%. Um, stress down 21%. And then we've got um, some of the other side of things, the self-esteem, body image and optimism. We are up 5%, 21% and 11%. So, um, some of those results, again, like I said, well, they weren't unexpected. It was um, a really, really nice outcome to see those things happening along with the weight loss. And obviously, um, those two things are actually tied together as well. So, um, some other further benefits we've seen um, separate than the research. Basically, it, it ends up being a really good personal development opportunity for players even. Sometimes um, in the UK, this is a really big one, but players will then actually go on to become staff. So we'll have guys that start as a participant and they'll actually end up maybe finding a passion for the whole concept and for the um, improving the lives and the mental health of these guys. And they'll go on to become coaches and actually um, end up becoming staff and running the program. Um, a lot of the guys transition out of our league into general teams and general league plays. So we've even got sites where our Manby Fat League will actually run um, concurrently with just a standard social sport league next door. And we've had guys that will actually play one or two seasons with us. Then they'll end up shuffling over into the, the kind of um, general league, I suppose, if you call it that. And that's obviously a really, really good result too. That's exactly what we're after. Um, we've seen some host sites of changing their service offerings. So it's expanded to even the, the canteens and the um, food services on Man B Fat Night. They'll start offering salads and some, some healthy foods, which is really cool. And um, yeah, just activize, activating a lot of unused spaces. Um, so why does it actually work? Which I suppose is what we're here to talk about today. So there's, there's a range of reasons and I think Jeff and Philip touched on this a lot. Um, so I'll, I'll probably talk just about the sort of specifics of why our program works. But again, I think 
this stuff really is applicable across all sport-based programs for men. Um, the first one is just, just that accountability. So um, the, probably the main thing with our programs, the guys aren't just accountable to themselves. They're also accountable to their teammates. Um, and whether that's the positive or the negative side of that, whichever it is that motivates them more, I suppose, they do know that whatever the result of their weigh-in is that week, it actually, there are other people relying on that as well for the program. So, um, you know, if they're at home and maybe they just can't be bothered going for that walk or they just, you know, they want to eat that unhealthy food, they know that the consequences of that actually extend beyond just themselves. It extends out to their teammates as well. So that's really, really helpful. Um, but they do also have that extra accountability just to themselves through the handbook and actually having to fill out a food diary, fill out exercise. So they know at the end of the week, they'll actually look back and they are accountable to what's happened. So um, I'd say that's a really big one. The, then we've got the, just the mateship of the program and being involved in a sport in general. So I briefly mentioned this before, but um, we've got each team and each league, league will have a WhatsApp group. And it sounds like a really, really simple thing but it's a super important part of the program. And a lot of the guys mentioned that it's actually their, their favorite part of the whole thing is that they'll, they'll be in a uh, WhatsApp group with their teammates and they just have banter in there, but they'll also give each other tips. So while the relationship with the league coach and that expert advice is really good, it's also equally important getting advice from each other. So once somebody might find a low carb beer that they reckon is really good, um, and they'll just jump in their WhatsApp group and, you know, hey, fellas, found this beer, it's really good, you should try it out. Um, that kind of stuff. And just that, that kind of mateship and camaraderie that it creates is, um, it, it adds a whole other element to the program. And, um, yeah, I think all sport-based programs kind of add that element. Um, the other thing is, I've described it as the, the locker room setting, but... I think um, what I mean by that is basically a lot, everyone that's been involved in sport and men's sport in particular, they kind of fondly remember that, um, you know, being in the chain rooms before the game or, you know, they, they talk about after the game and having a beer with your mates and that kind of, that kind of setting. Um, a lot of guys see that as a really kind of safe space. Um, and that's generally where we actually conduct our weigh-ins. So they'll turn up, they'll, you know, be chucking on their boots, they'll be chucking on their socks, they'll be having a bit of banter with one of their mates. And that's when they'll actually step on the scales. And that's when the coach will provide them feedback for that week. So it provides a setting where um, I think males are often traditionally not super open to kind of talk about maybe the struggles they've been having with their diet or you know, they've been struggling with certain type of exercise or even just their mental health or whatever it may be. Um, but given that setting, there's something about it that kind of does make them open up and they just feel a lot more comfortable talking to their coach, talking to their teammates about that kind of thing, which is really good. Um, celebrating team success, obviously. So uh, a lot of people talk about the whole thing of individual sports versus team sports and celebrating wins and that kind of stuff. And um, it kind of that flows on to their, uh, their success here, where a lot of the guys, we do hand out certificates for their personal 5%, 10% weight loss goals, but most of the guys, uh, anecdotally, if you speak to them, they'll, they'll mention that their favorite part of, the, um, part of the program is when if their team won the league, or uh, you know, if their team, maybe they lost on the field, but they came from behind because they had a big, big score off the field from the weight loss. And, um, that idea of being able to actually celebrate with their teammates when they succeed and not just celebrate alone. I think that's really successful. And um, last one is just the, the role of the lead coach. So I suppose, again, this ties in with um, the kind of, oops, sorry, the, uh, the kind of locker room thing I was chatting about before, but a lot of guys that have been involved in sport before, the idea of having a coach that's handing out advice or giving you tips is something that feels really familiar to them. So um, the idea that they're turning up each week to the chain rooms and they've got a, a league coach that will actually say, hey, mate, you need to improve this, this and this. It just it seems to resonate with our guys. And um, they end up forming a really strong bond with that coach as well. So we've got a lot of the coaches that might be involved for you know, a couple of years. We've got some coaches that have been involved since the very start of the program and they've known some of these players for you know, 18 months now. So they form really, really strong bonds with these players and it's, um, it's a really good relationship that they form that helps them open up as well. Um, there's obviously a lot more, but I think I'll leave it at that for now. We've got uh, obviously some uh, good news stories about the program. 
And um, so where are we now? Basically, it is primarily a West Australia based league uh, program at the moment. So we've got nine leagues in Western Australia and we have got one in South Australia as well. Um, we generally partner with local councils to run the sites. So uh, at the moment we are in discussions with a bunch of councils over in the East Coast. So our agreement with the UK does cover um, the rights, I suppose, for all of Australia. So um, we're chatting to uh, councils in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria. Um, we've got lots of interest. And we're, we're hoping that we can kind of expand this out all across Australia. So um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for me for now. I think I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that and we can uh, pass it back to you, Greg. Great. Thanks, Tim. Look, that's, I think that's really sensational work that you're doing. Um, and what I picked up, one thing I picked up, which I'll just talk about quickly now, is the locker room setting thing that um, the locker room setting is comfortable for men and also the um, all of those increases you got in um, their mental well-being. There's a group starting up in Newcastle here for older surfers and it's called the changing room and it's on, on the same principle of surfers going to the changing room to get changed but also to change anything they'd like in their life that's not working for them. So it's a great concept and I can I can see that sort of idea spreading in different ways around sports. Look, what I'd like to do at the moment is probably open it up for people to ask questions or have a discussion with our three speakers. And can I, there was a few things in the chat room that I've picked up. Um, Stella, if she's here, um, asked a question about programs for men 12 to 25. Do you want to talk about that, Stella? Yep, does that work? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, um, hi, my name's Stella, and I work at Headspace in her school. Um, so, for those of you that might know, Headspace is the youth early intervention um, service, and one of our priority areas is working with young males and providing um, services and groups and programs for young males. Um, so, I was just interested to hear. Um, kind of with the programs that have been discussed. And sorry, I've been in and out as well um, throughout the session, um, but I was just curious if there were any programs specifically targeted for that age group um, or any, any males within that age range, because um, they're the kind of things that we'd be looking at um, partnering with or exploring more at our particular centre. Great, thanks, Stella. Any of our speakers want to talk to that? Yeah, um, I don't know if I've got a great answer, but in terms of the work um, that we're progressing, um, as you could probably see, there seems to, there's um, age-specific information that's really important. And so, um, you know, we have uh, preschool versions of our programs, primary school, um, and one, one of the things that's next on my list is, a, is to do a, a teenage version as well for those of father figures and whether they be daughters or daughters and sons. Um, and then also, um, depending on the age of their children. There's obviously men who are in their 20s who have fit in that three-year-old bracket as well where they, they can, there's no age restrictions in terms of those that bring along their three to five-year-olds. So no, there's lots of school-based um, initiatives for those, but not yet that I'm aware of, sorry. Okay. Great. Right. Great. Yes, go ahead. Uh, go ahead here. Just looking across the, um, hi Stella, hi everyone. Mm -hmm. Just looking across the, uh, the program for the day as well. And I think there's a couple of speakers coming up later who may be more targeted towards that, that, younger, that younger demographic. I mean, there's, there's an interesting kind of um, uh, uh, issue here in that when you look at sort of participation in sport, it tends to drop off massively after 20, yeah. after 25. I'm sure, you know, our speakers could, some of our speakers could highlight uh, that better than I, than I can. And so often um, one of the things that young men are doing really well with their health is being physically active, broadly speaking, though they may be smoking and drinking and doing, doing, doing other things. However, sports certainly used for a range of things, not just physical activity. So if you look at the, um, the sport and life training program, uh, so a lot of programs are actually going into community settings and assuming that guys are already involved and then using that existing involvement to engage with them around I mean you're from Headspace so so they're engaging around mental health so I know that um, um, sport and uh, salt sport and life training in Melbourne speaking in the next session they do that kind of stuff 
um, Speak Up and Stay Chatty in Tasmania, targeting younger people through sports venues. And um, one of our members and a former board member, Dr. Simon Rice at Origin, who's done some um, really good research work around the barriers to young men accessing mental health services, has been doing some work um, through um, training like sports coaches to, to, to be, to be a, a aware of mental health issues amongst, um, amongst younger men. So there are a few things out there, um, Stella. Uh, and also I think um, uh, Timmy Duggan uh, from the Northern Territory, who's in the, in the session this afternoon, uh, Hoops for Health. He's done a load of really interesting stuff with young Aboriginal men and, and, and basketball. And of course, um, it's just part, I'm saying of course to myself, the, uh, the Clontarf Foundation in terms of Aboriginal men is, has been doing amazing work um, using sport to engage uh, boys and girls who are, who are, who are disengaged. So there's, there's stuff out there, um, not, maybe not so much around the kind of physical health and fitness stuff, because obviously there are young men who are unfit and unhealthy, but um, they're not tended to be seen as a kind of a priority population, um, because younger men generally are, are generally more fit and active. Oh, that's a really sweeping statement. So I'll leave um, anyone else who wants to bounce off what I've just said to, to come back, because I'm not the expert, but I've got some ideas of a few projects we've got on today. Thanks, Glenn. That's good. Thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. Have we got anyone else in the room that would like to ask some questions to our speaker? To our panel? Well, I've got a few questions because picking up, picking up on uh, what Glenn just mentioned about the young men, I work a great deal with older men and it's a real issue for a lot of older men. Um, <clears throat> the whole thing of keeping healthy and also gyms. I work with a group, I live in Newcastle, but I work with a group in Sydney of cancer survivors who are older men. And they complain to me nearly every session I, I see about the way they get treated in gyms. That's why they won't go, because they need a program that's specifically aimed at their age. And they get, you know, young men in there saying, yeah, let's work out and do that and we'll build you up. They don't need that or want that. Have you come across um general question uh come across programs that work for older men in terms um, of sport i suppose I'll, i can touch on our program specifically yeah. but we um our in our very first season our biggest loser so we basically the guy who lost the most weight in the season he was actually a, a 72 year old man wow. yeah, which, which is awesome and it's um, while we don't necessarily say that we're targeting older men, we have actually um, found a lot of success in that demographic. Um, and I think one of the reasons is exactly like you said, it's they, they don't necessarily want to go to a gym and have some personal trainer, you know, telling them to lift weights and all that kind of stuff. Yep. And um, there, there's something about just uh, getting involved in sport again and getting involved in that team sport environment Yep. seem to sort of just rejuvenate their passion for it. it. Might be we've had guys that maybe they haven't played in 30 years, and they come down and they're you know they're getting around the guys again, and they're playing sport, and it just it really excites them. And um, so yeah, we we have found in our program that that sort of 50, 60, even 70s mm. guys are um, guys are seeing a lot of success. So um, yeah, it's, it's been really good. That's great. That's excellent. I, Greg, I might just come in there and talk. Yep. A about my knowledge and experience with working with older individuals, especially those with uh, chronic disease or recovering from something like cancer. Um, often the, the situation is quite complex, especially in older individuals with musculoskeletal limitations. And uh, as um, Tim just highlighted, sometimes personal trainers don't have the, the training or experience to actually understand to be adjusted and get to get the program right, plus the, the gym mightn't be the right environment for them. So um, hopefully people online are aware of the accredited exercise physiologist or the AEP profession. And these individuals, there's about 6,000 of them now in Australia, are uh, trained specifically to work with people that are more complex, that are older, that have chronic disease. And so these people are graduating from university, seeing themselves up as exercise physiologists, members of the, the health profession, quite different to the personal trainer that, that might get their qualifications in three to six months. So the exercise physiologists really are who people that do have a complex situation should be going to see to get advice. They don't tend to 
um, be found in your common gyms. They tend to work themselves like a physiotherapist might in private practice and uh, certainly getting advice for them to get the program adjusted um, is what I'd be uh, suggesting. I think you're on mute. Great, thanks Jeff. Um, I, I will come back to our panel speakers towards the end just for some final comments from you. But I just wanted to, one of the things I noticed in all the work that you're doing, obviously the connection between um, psychological um, issues and mental health and well-being um, goes up when you're involved in sport and exercise. That's the takeaway message for me from all of your presentations. We have a, we have a, a centre here in Newcastle that opened six months ago called Real, Real 365, like keeping it real every day of the year, which is a gym and mental health center in one, where they do a lot of gym, they have a, a, it's run by a guy who is a gym instructor, but he's also works for Are You OK? And they have yoga there and they have people talking about mental health and they run meditation. It's fantastic and it's a fantastic gym for older men, I think, because there's no mirrors and the walls are all painted black. Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, and we're trying to get, wouldn't you agree? And we're trying to get older men to come along and form a group there. And I'm thinking of doing some um, yoga or meditation work in there. But it's a great concept and it's taken off really, really well, combining, <clears throat> combining the two things together of, you know, improving mental health and gym work at the same time. It's a great idea. Can I just um, give time to other people who haven't spoken yet or would like to talk about Yes, Bob. Unmute, unmute, Bob. Thanks. Am I unmuted? Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. First of all, guys, this is wonderful. This is wonderful to hear and seeing health and sport find a marriage in the middle ground to change men's behavior. I think it's extraordinary. Uh, having said that, I have a question for anybody here. Uh, I was a coach in the US for a long time. I won't bore you with my resume, but the question is, and it's kind of rooted in something that Dr. Jane Goodall once said about that we share a 92% genetic code with chimpanzees. We are inherently violent. We are inherently competitive, combative, uh, we want to dominate, we want to, and then it overflows into our culture. It overflows into our sports. I come from a country that loves football. Well, that is a gladiator violent sport. And we're seeing the growth of uh, things like UFC, this unlimited fighting thing, as being the models for men and young boys as the uh, progression into manhood. Having said that, the question is, if that is in our genetic map, our DNA, is anybody in this group in Australia, and I'm, a, I'm an American hiding out in the pandemic and happy to be here, um, is there anybody addressing this kind of rude aggression and taking this health and sport to shift that natural coding? I'll stop there and just ask a question. Great question. Would any of our Panel members, like to take that on? <laughs> I mean, uh, th thanks, Bob. I mean, one, one of the interesting things about, um, I think you might even, the DNA matching might be 98% actually with chimpanzees. But, um, <laughs> so the, the rough, what's interesting, the rough and tumble play that I briefly alluded to in our programs that we target, which is really um, unique to fathers, but it doesn't mean we, we did rough and tumble play in our mothers and daughters program, for example, but the men were more likely to enjoy, sustain it and do it at home. But these forms of play was based on studies with watching animals interact and they just do it as a natural form of their development. Um, and while it looks aggressive in its nature, it's really play fighting. And the fascinating thing about rough and tumble play is that it actually has a whole range of social and emotional benefits for children, actually impacts on part of their prefrontal cortex development. And so not only is it a vigorous workout, not only is it really good conditioning 
for sports because lots of sports revolve involve body contact and, and you know you mentioned football in the US but you know basketball netball all these sports as well to have good spatial awareness and kinesthetic sense so this is really important um, for fathers to do with both their sons and daughters and even more interesting it, it, children that are exposed to quality rough and tumble play have better social and emotional regulation social skills emotional regulation but also have better ability to control their aggression and so it leads to less kind of behaviors where impulse they they act out which is important in the society we live in where where, where you know we're not back where you have to be able to make good decisions about the use of your aggression in certain contexts. So rough and tumble play is an outlet. So we kind of encompass and celebrate that natural inclination to do those forms of wrestling and fighting. But a father is someone who can really control that in a way they have the strength and the motivation to do it. And so I think that's a really unique element of what we target in our father programs. Great. Bravo. Thanks, Phil. Um, have we got Greg on the in the chat somewhere that wanted to have a word to say? Greg, I'll jump yeah. in a second. I think it was Dr. Neil Hall, but can I just ah. just bounce off this point point, yep. point here? Um, this is a really interesting part of the conversation um, because you know we've laid a foundation here, obviously, <laughs> that sport and exercise is good for health, uh, and it's obviously good for for, for men's health. And now we're getting into this really interesting conversation about gender and, 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 and masculinity, which is definitely going to be infused through the conversation for the rest of the day. And whenever we look at what we call male friendly services, there's increasingly this tension between between sort of the what some would call the stereotypes of masculinity and then, uh, and then allowing new 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 expressions of masculinity uh, healthier some would say expressions of masculinity to it to emerge and so like you know a, a purely strengths-based approach would say men love sport um men are active and you know they need to express their energy and stuff so let's use sport as a as, as a way to get them involved and then others might say well that kind of you know stereotypical masculine approach is quite exclusive can be can be damaging in some ways that competitiveness and where, where, where activity and strength and aggression becomes violent, which is what Bob was sort of pushing towards, but also can be quite excluding of, of, of blokes who don't fit in to the norm. And we've already started to mention, now often our first thought there is to say, for example, like, you know, men who identify as gay, bisexual, transgender or intersex. Uh, and certainly this afternoon, we've got Dave Oliver, who believes he is Australia's only um, out um, professional rugby union coach and he's got a really strong focus on making rugby union more inclusive to, uh, to, to gay and bisexual and uh, transgender and intersex men um, but also we've mentioned you know over, men are overweight who don't necessarily fit in the kind of the ideal norm and, and older men who don't <laughs> always fit in to the, the, the ideal norm and I'm really interested in, in and maybe the panelists have got some thoughts on this is is how do we balance the tension between really embracing the fact that blokes love sport? And you know, when you look at things like smoking, drinking, um, diet, weight, and exercise, the one factor where men are either sort of even with or slightly better than women is physical exercise. And yet, but that's not all men, right? That's not all men. There are a lot of blokes who aren't doing it, and blokes are more likely to be sedentary particularly like, you know, drivers and people in those kind of sedentary um, professions. So, so how do we balance the massive opportunity that sport clearly gives us to engage with men, but also make sure that everything we do is inclusive of, of, of men in all their diversity? I'd love to hear our panel's thoughts on, 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 on that. Uh, and, and, and I think it was Dr. Neil Hall, Greg, who might have had his, his, hand, up, his hand up, but I've jumped in there. You maybe come back to Neil. Um, I'll, I'll quickly jump in. It's an interesting, very interesting question you ask, and it's um, something that, well, I, I probably don't actually have an answer for, but we we have to balance that concept all the time with our program as well, in the sense that, um, as I outlined before, one of the reasons the program is so successful is obviously that sort of competitive element, the fact that they're getting involved in a team environment, they want to win and all those things. Um, and while that is inherently why the program is successful, it's also um, one of the main barriers to guys 
so when we get new players and we kind of ask mm. why, why haven't you been doing these things before why haven't you been exercising or whatever it may be the the main barrier is that they um they felt intimidated by that aspect of it mm. and so for example the reason they'll join our league is because they didn't want to go and join a normal casual soccer league because they felt, um, you know, maybe they felt like they weren't fit enough to even go down. They were a bit intimidated by the physicality. Um, so uh, I suppose I'm more just agreeing with your point than actually providing an answer, but it's something that we, we really do have to try and balance making it a competitive environment with not making it intimidating to the point that there's actually barriers to entry and we turn people away. So um, yeah, it, it is a really fine line to try and, try and balance yeah. that. Well, it sounds to me like, Tim, what you're doing is you're not making it an either or, but you're, you're integrating those two aspects, both building on the strengths, e.g. competitiveness, but also um, guarding against the, uh, the, the, the barriers where competitiveness can be a barrier. So you're not saying, you know, a male tendency towards comp competition or, 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 yeah, towards competition is either negative or positive, you're saying it has both positive and negative aspects and you're, you're, you're building on the positive whilst being aware of and overcoming the negative. If, is, that, is that kind of a fair summary? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's a fair summary. Yeah. yeah I, th right. I think that's exactly right. It's, I think you've, you've got to be careful to not go, um, not go too far either way, basically. And, and um, it, it's a, a great point, Glenn. And, and, and clearly, I, I, like today's presentation was very brief and focused on aspects of how we can use sport in a positive way to get men to programs, given how few fathers sign up. But um, I've often said that our, our father-based programs are a really great bait and switch opportunity as well. Because yes, they will do practical sessions with sports skills, but they'll also sit through sessions learning about how to emotionally connect with your children, about improving relationships that are in family, how to um, be more involved and, and focusing on co-parenting, on all those aspects of how we can um, better our own mental health and be more accessible and available. So that's definitely a part of it. And clearly, um, you know, even targeting fathers, you know, we've, we've had our critics and the most common question is you can imagine that, you know, in many, many radio interviews that we've done, anytime we have a father program, we're recruiting, what about mums, aren't they important? So, um, and similarly, we've run mums programs and parents programs and not once I've been asked, what about dads? So I yeah. kind of make no apologies from a scientific point of view to mm. firstly explore the potential impact mm. uh, and then to engage men as they have not been engaged and understand that they matter in their children's lives, that, that they have an independent, unique influence and whatever their family system or setting. And the question around, uh, do you think it matters if there's a female who does rough and tumble with their children or practices sports skills and not the father, is, will that children not be able to thrive as well? Um, and while there hasn't been specific studies around that, from all my experience in all that area, is it would not matter for that child's benefit. Being involved in rough and tumble play, having an opportunity to enhance your skills mm. at home to support what's happening at schools is important for kids. And it would not matter if that's a male or female. What it matters is, is that you have uh, a parent, a grandparent who values that arena and then is more likely to initiate it, enjoy it, and then to do it repeatedly. And then the child will benefit. So in any families where there's two mums, two dads, it actually doesn't really matter. What we do know is those things are really important for children. Because now um, many women have been marginalised when they were girls in their lives and are less skilled and less active in general, and we have data that supports that, um, that they are less likely um, to enjoy and engage in those particular activities. And so therefore, it's a really unique um, recruitment hook that gets many of the dads in who, without our father-based programs, are not signing up for general parenting programs. Yeah. Great. And sorry to, to, to sort of push this further but I, I, Jeff you're in a comp slightly different I feel you're in a slightly different world of, of a much more gender neutral approach to, to 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 what you do but I'm really interested to know if you've got any insights on on, on any differences in, in in how we approach men and women but also I suppose um, 
because we're interested in barriers, right? And I'm interested to know if you have specific barriers to getting, I don't know, like GPs just to prescribe exercise, for example. I mean, mm. it, it seems that it seems like social prescribing, for example, like part run is becoming a little bit more acceptable uh, and not just for the fitness part, but for the social connection piece. But I'm really interested to know, because it's not rocket science, right? As the title says, what well, insights have you got on, on different approaches with gender and, and also what barriers you're seeing to the great work you're doing in terms of making it mainstream? Yeah, the, the rocket science is working out how to get people active, obviously. And I think it's, it's horses for courses. And sport is going to be great for a lot of people if we, if we look at sport as a combination of um, people coming together. But I think it's also important to realise that the major barrier people talk about is time. And then we've heard also today that environment can be intimidating to people as well. So um, certainly from... Uh, a perspective that we've been pushing for a long time is people to understand that they don't need to spend a lot of time to exercise. They also don't necessarily need to get in their exercise gear and drive somewhere and or do all the rest. And it's going to be fascinating to see what happens um, when we get out of the pandemic with people that perhaps have adjusted to being able to exercise at home for resistance exercise and perhaps around their home environment, around their streets and to, uh, to get their aerobic exercise in, whether when things are lifted and they can get freely back into the gym or join the fourth clubs, that this will happen. I know there's a lot of uh, gym owners and community sporting groups that are very worried that people are going to lose the habit of what they've done before and be used to adjusting to exercising without necessarily that additional time demand that it takes. So I think, um, in terms of advice for people, just recognising that you don't need a lot to keep yourself as fit as you need to be to be healthy. So doing exercises, resistance exercise at home with body weights or stuff that's around mm. using the, the environment around the house potentially to get your aerobic exercise can get people fit, as fit as they need to be to be healthy in a short period of time without costing any money and uh, getting those... Um, decreasing the, the time that it takes so mm. men and women it, it's the same could i say something you're on bob you're on uh, thank you uh i'll try and be brief and even though i'm old and i go on and on we had a guy named george sheehan uh was editor of running magazine in the early 70s and 80s running became very popular in the u.s and people would always complain, I don't have time, I don't have time. Well, we did the research and we found if you ran an hour a day, you needed one hour less sleep. So it was like a zero sum game here. You were actually benefiting your health and gaining time over here uh, as one thing. The other in terms of inclusion, for us in the US, we expanded the, for lack of a better word, we'll say the playing field girls soccer, boys soccer, co-ed soccer, women coaches, men coaches, assistants, positive coaching alliances. We looked at it and we flooded it with whatever we could to make it better as parents or coaches or, and, um, and we got community support, you know, we, the mayors, city councils, that kind of stuff, school districts. Uh, we found alliances with people. And, and then we had legislation. Uh, Title IX in the U.S. created women's uh, athletic programs in universities. So we began small, but we continued the change, which is kind of what I see here, which is that you guys are the pioneers about making it better, you know? And, and it's like, it's that old silly movie with uh, Kevin Costner. If you build it, it will come. And I think that's true. <laughs> so I'll just stop there and say good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. That was great. Is Neil Hall around? Neil's been wanting to say something for a while, I think. Or oh, he might not be. Um, anybody, is, is there anyone else in the room who would like to bring up a new topic? something we haven't talked about or talk about um, any other issues related to what our panel's been speaking about. Let me 
just checking through. Hi guys. Yep, great, Ross. Um, so my name's Ross. Um, you might tell from the accent. I'm from Scotland. <laughs> um, but I actually work up in the Kimberley for an organisation called Nundalangari, who um, I run the physical activity programme um, and a lot of stuff in men's health as well. Um, I was just, I was just, I've done it for a while, but I think one of the biggest stumbling blocks uh, we have in general up here, but especially with the blokes, is the 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 shame factor. So getting, you know, especially like middle aged and older men to actually get up and do some exercise in front of a group, it always seems to be an issue. There always seems to be that that stigma, you know, about getting up and looking a bit silly or a bit embarrassing or whatever. So is there anything you guys do a little bit different, you know, that encourages, especially these the indigenous folks to get up and actually have a go? Because, uh, you know, sometimes you can get them to do it, but other times to do it, pull the teeth. And, you know, it, you know, it does make a session that you've, you know, planned out and thought out, you know, a bit more difficult. And, you know, you know, for lack of better words, it can become a bit of a pain in the arse at times, you know, trying to motivate, you know, a room full of 20 middle-aged folks to call it, you know, sit down, shut up kind of thing. Okay. Any uh, panel? <laughs> what are yeah, we I'll go if the other two didn't have anything to add yet. Um, it's, it is a really interesting point you raise, and that's, um, it perhaps follows on from what I was saying before, in particular with our program, is that's, probably the most common thing we encounter with the guys that turn up is that they, um, they felt a bit embarrassed maybe about um, exercising in front of other people because of, they believe their fitness level wasn't up to scratch. So um, with our program, again, that's all I can really speak on. But the way we combat that is, um, again, just through that, that environment and um, just providing a number of people that are in the same boat. So if, if it is just one individual that kind of part of maybe running up there that feels like he's maybe surrounded by a bunch of guys that are a lot fitter than him, or he feels like he's, um, he's just on a different level, it can be a bit awkward. But whereas uh, what we, all of our guys may not have the best fitness level, they may not be able to move like they used to, all of those things, but when they're surrounded by 20 other blokes who are in the exact same boat, they're really not too concerned by it. It's only um, if they're to turn up to an environment where it's maybe designed to a level that isn't for them or they feel like they're a little bit excluded. So, um, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. We get that exact same feedback. And I suppose my only advice would be as much as you can, just try and create an environment where they feel like they're surrounded by a bunch of blokes who are in the exact same boat as them. And it seems to make them feel a lot more comfortable. Mm. And um, thanks, Tim. And another, there, there's, if anyone's any further information, other programs we've um, uh, developed out of Newcastle and evaluated, Shed It Program, Shed It Recharge, Workplace Power, which are more self-help programs for men, exercise and eating. Uh, more recent one, uh, Miles Young and Ryan Drew have been involved in Shed It Recharge to address um, you know, weight and also low mood. In our family-based programs, a really important aspect is that they're never on public display and that they always are only doing their activities with father and children. They're in their own little worlds as opposed to, you know, being against other families. That's a really key piece. And there's also modifications for every exercise. So, you know, you look at the variations for, for push-ups that you can make easier or harder. And so another thing just to add on there in working with groups of men in a practical setting and situation, rather than all doing the same exercise at, at once necessarily, you can break up into stations. So if everyone was just doing push-ups, for example, someone had finished first and look up and go, hang on, I'm the first one finished. If you've got multiple stations happening and moving around, it's less likely to know how you are in comparison to other people. So you can have both the modifications, but also have variety in your sessions is what I'd recommend. Thanks for that. Um, I know the great work that you do, Philip, with families and, and fathers and sons and daughters. A general question to the panel, at any point in Australia's history, like right now, 40% um, of males in this country are single from 18 up. What your tips or hints on getting single men uh, engaged in exercise programs in general? Or, or the work that you do, but generally, do you find it's harder to get single men involved or not? Uh, 
I probably um, don't focus specifically on single men, uh, but a lot of our work in people with chronic disease and older individuals, they do, do tend to be perhaps um, by themselves at that stage of their life. Uh, I think it comes back to understanding what is the motivator for someone to be physically active. And certainly we now teach our students, it's got to be so early in the conversation when you're working one-on-one -on -one with somebody, well, why is it? Why do you want to improve your fitness? And I think in, in our health system, we're becoming much better about what's called patient-focused treatment, that rather than trying to, to worry about what the practitioner thinks the person should be worried about, you really try and find out what they're concerned about, what motivates them, and then that's the trigger that you continually use to, to design what you do with them or um, modify it, and that's their goal. If it, um, whether it's to, to get off a, a diabetes medication or to be able to um, go and, and walk to the, the shops and back and, and carry the groceries back. They're the, the things that you need to find out first because everyone is so different. That's what we certainly see. And our current approach, you know, I, I put it up there, the 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity and two resistance training sessions a day. That um, is a good starting point, but really you need to, especially with older individuals and who may be single, you need to bury down to what their motivation is. Perhaps it's to improve their fitness enough to be attractive to someone else so they can uh, no longer be single. <laughs> um, yeah, it, anyone else on the panel just want to respond to that? We're getting close to uh, wrapping up. Yeah, what we found useful was, was mentoring programs where we were asking uh, young people anywhere from 22 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 70 to uh, take on a young man, a young girl. Uh, and it solved two things. One was it, it got that single person engaged. It was an extra person for that child out of the family dynamics, whatever they were functional, dysfunctional. Um, that was one. And, and two, it also solved a social problem, which was that our divorce rate is almost 57% now. Uh, between two thirds and three quarters of all dissolutions are filed by women. And what we're finding is women are getting divorces, but they're also uh, taking the children besides the house. But that's a little bit of a joke. But what's happening is we're having a kind of fatherless America. And that's been going on for a long time now. That's why there's all these fathers groups growing, not just in the US, but globally. Globally, this explosion is partly due to culture, it's partly due to antiquated laws. But point being is the mentoring program had the ability to solve a larger social problem or address it and also help that single person, because in, in the US, we now have over 75 million single people. There's books and books and books written about it called Going Solo. So um, anything to bring us back together is useful. I'll stop there. No, thanks, Bob. That's an interesting perspective. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Look, we're nearing the end of this session. One minute to uh, Philip, Jeff, and Tim, just um, sum up. I'll start with you, Philip. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, in, in a summary, I'd say, and Jeff maybe alluded to that, often um, we probably incorrectly frame a question around physical activity and exercise or sports, particularly with fathers or families. Why aren't you motivated? I think a better way in the way we frame it is, well, for what motivates you? Yeah. And so in the context of us with our family work and for many of the families that are just really busy in the context of their lives, to have a forum, to have conversations with other men, to have evidence-based information presented that is both uh, you know, important to know, to improve awareness and knowledge, but also give you the skills uh, and the motivation and tapping into some of those psychological theories we spoke about with potentially the motivation to do it for their children more so for themselves, but by doing activities together, that co-activity, there are physical and mental health, health benefits and relationship benefits for families. So that, 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 that is our approach in motivating families. 
and taking the lens of trying to target those key motivators. Great. Thanks, Thanks Philip. Jeff? Yeah, I guess one thing we do know is that um, the most, the majority, the overwhelming majority like to do physical activity with, with someone else rather than by themselves. So mm -hmm. buddying up is something that obviously from what both um, Phil and Tim have spoken about has, has been extremely uh, integral part of why their programs have been so successful. But even on an individual basis, trying to, trying to get people to, to do more activity with their um, partners if they've got one, sibling. Yeah. And the other thing that's been really popular is uh, getting a dog. So <laughs> um, getting a dog is one, of the, and, and else it's probably more, well, it is more um, for um, men. But uh, yeah, increasing physical activity in pet owners uh, yep. outcomes. So buddying up, whether it's with a human or a canine. Great, good advice. And Tim? Um, yeah, I suppose not really too much to add, uh, to add for me. It's, um, I just think it's good that these conversations are happening and that these programs exist. So I know back in the day in the UK, the Manby Foot Fat Football concept originally started because there was a bloke sitting in a, a Weight Watchers um, and he'd tried, I think, Light and Easy and a few of these different things and he just uh, he couldn't find any programs for men at the time. Um, this was a while ago. And I think these days that's, that's very, very different. The fact that these programs exist and that these conversations are happening, I think, is um, awesome. So let's keep it up. Great. Thanks, Tim. Thanks to all our panel speakers and... A little bit of applause either by your using your hands or symbol. Thank you all very much and I'll throw back to Glenn. Thanks Greg and thanks for uh, all the panelists. What a great session to start the day and I'm looking forward to uh, going back and reviewing each of those presentations and drawing out the key points of them because there's a there's a fantastic resource there that we've laid down uh, today. Um, guys, you're free to go now if you, if you, if you wish and if you have to. Um, we'll just have some, uh, some looser informal conversation for the next 10 or 15 minutes and you're welcome to stick around and, and hear that too. Um, first, I'm just going to let you know, but you're, you, if you can't stick around, you're free to go and we say thank you kindly and we look forward to seeing you again soon.